Okay, good morning, lads and ladies. Welcome back to Calc 2. Um, today is another exciting day for us in the land of sequences and series. Um, today is the day we're going to learn the test that kind of everybody remembers, uh, which isn't to say you should forget the other tests. They are actually more powerful in a lot of ways. Um, but you may have noticed that a lot of these convergence tests so far require some element of creativity, right? Like the comparison tests, you have to uh, come up with something to compare against. And, and in some cases, you need to come up with an inequality relating them. Um, <clears throat> even the alternating series test and the integral test require some amount of something like creative effort. Uh, and you're showing that the thing is decreasing, for example, in either the integral test or the alternating series test. You have an element of choice as to how you're going to do that. And there's a little bit of wiggle room where you're like, okay, is it always decreasing? Is it decreasing from some point on? Stuff like that. Um, the tests I'm going to share with you today are very mechanical, and this is why people tend to remember them better, because they're, they're super straightforward. So you plug the thing in, you get a result out. Um, and that's nice, right? That is something that we like, you know? It's, it's nice to have a, a really clear result when you can. Unfortunately, there are limitations to this test, <clears throat> um, you know, something that is super duper mechanical. Uh, is very rarely super wide reaching, right? Like if you want to learn how to cook really well, you can get a cookbook and follow those recipes to the T and you will get out what the cookbook says you get out. Um, but if you want to learn to be a chef, you need to learn how to improvise and be creative. So today we are learning about the cookbook, right? Kind of, kind of backwards really, but this is how you learn how to cook too. Yeah, you experiment and then you go to the rigid stuff and then you learn how to combine the creativity with the rigid stuff. Um, <clears throat> Today comes the rigid stuff. Uh, what I'm talking about, of course, are the root and ratio tests. And before we introduce those, because they involve some language and definitions that we haven't used yet, um, I need to share with you those language uh, and definitions, that, that language and those definitions. All right, let's get to it. Remember, test two is around the corner. I'm sorry, uh, yeah, for you guys, test two is around the corner. This is MAC 2312, section number 004, which means we're talking about Calc 2. And today is the 27th of October, 2021. Uh, the section number is 11.6 that we're covering today. And the title is Absolute Convergence and the Root and Ratio Tests. So two new tests today. But before we can introduce those tests, I need to tell you what absolute convergence means. Uh, and this is also going to give us occasion to talk a bit more about that rearrangement theorem I mentioned um, last time. Mind blowing, melt your brain out your ears shit, where I can take a series, reorder the terms, and get new values out. Very weird, very weird. Um, fuck it, let's do it. Oh, uh, don't we need a theorem? Yeah, OK. Um, before I do that, sorry. Before I do that, I also want to talk a little bit more from section 11.5. So we learned last time um, the alternating series test. I want to show you an estimation theorem. For alternating series. So we didn't get to talk about this the other day. I haven't put any of this in your homework yet, but I, I am going to give you some problems on the study guide using this estimation theorem. Um, and it is something we will use a little bit when we talk about power series. So before we talk about absolute convergence, here's a theorem. This is the estimation theorem for alternating series.
So you remember at, at the end of class last time, somebody, I'm sorry, I forget who, um, asked me, so we don't have to find the value of the series. We're just trying to find out whether the series converges or diverges. And I said, yeah, small caveat there. While you cannot find the exact value of most of these series, you can estimate their value. Now remember, if I'm trying to estimate the value of a series, kind of the dumb thing to do is to just write out the first like 10 terms and add up those first 10 terms. Right? Sure, the series has infinitely many terms, but if it's a convergent series, the big terms will be the first few terms. All the late terms have to be very small because for a series to converge, remember, terms have to go to zero and quickly. So what this says is that if S equals sigma, whatever, uh, n from one to infinity, negative one to the n, the n, yeah, and this could be a wherever, this could be negative one to the n plus one. If S is an alternating series, any alternating series, then we can, uh, uh, alternating series which converges, sorry. Obviously, we cannot do this for divergent series. If S is any alternating series which converges, then we can estimate S using its partial sums. For large n. And what this theorem does is it gives me a, a quantitative measure of how good that estimate is. So the quality of that approximation can be described as the absolute value of S minus Sn. This is, uh, I'm going to write more stuff here, so just hang on for a second. The absolute value of S minus Sn. Here's the exact value of the series. Here is the estimate. Right, here's the nth partial sum. So we're talking about here, how far is the nth partial sum from the exact value of the series? In other words, this quantity right here is the error in this approximation. And what this theorem guarantees is that that is no larger than B sub capital N plus one. And if you look back at the textbook, at our proof of the alternating series test, this theorem is built right into that picture. All right, let me show you. Here's S. Here, for example, is S3. If I want to know how far is S from S3, that's the distance here, right? The distance from this to this. And what my theorem says is that the distance from S to S3 can't be bigger than B4. Why? Well, remember this nesting process. So B4 is going to take me back over here to the left. I'm subtracting B4 in this picture. And I hop over S as I do that. So the distance from S to S3 has to be less than the distance from S3 to S4. And the distance from S3 to S4 is B4. That's all. That's all we're saying here. So the distance from the exact value of the series to the nth partial sum is no greater than the distance from the nth partial sum to the n plus first partial sum, which is B sub n plus 1. People get fucked up behind this because they're afraid of absolute values and they're afraid of inequalities. I understand. Um, let me just show you a quick example of how we use this and then we're going to move on.
let's try to approximate the value of sigma n from zero to infinity, uh, or no, sorry, let's do it from one, sigma n from one to infinity, negative one to the n plus one over n. And let's do it accurate to three decimal places. Now, yeah, you could plug this thing into a computer and just write out, like, you know, add up the first thousand terms. That would do the job. Um, you know, if you're uncertain, you can just use more and more and more terms. <clears throat> but what people who solve real world problems need to know is how accurate is your approximation, right? So how many terms do I need to guarantee I get three decimal places correct? That's what we're trying to figure out here. So the question is, uh, we know that S is pretty close to Sn if capital N is big. How big does capital N need to be to guarantee that Sn is correct to three decimal places? <clears throat> um, my theorem is what saves the day here. This inequality is what's going to tell me how big n needs to be in order to get this thing correct to three decimal places. The name for this piece right here this is the distance from S to Sn. This is the error in Sn, right? How much are you off by? It's the error. What we want to do is make sure that this error is small enough that it doesn't fuck up the first three decimal places of my answer. So how big an error can I have and still get the first three decimal places correct? I want the error to be less than zero point, let's see. If the error was less than one, then I could be wrong in the first decimal place, right? Or, you know, I could be wrong in the ones place. So this needs to be a zero. If the error, if this was a one, then I could be wrong in the tenths place, the first decimal, the first thing after the decimal. So I want that to be a zero. I want the second decimal place to be correct. I want the third decimal place to be correct. And then I can allow some tolerance in the fourth decimal place, right? And depending on, on your rounding, um, you could say that, you know, a four in this fourth place would be okay, but if I want to be safe, this is good. So I want to make sure the error is small enough that if you add a number like this to my approximation, I'll still be correct in the first three decimal places. All right. So I know what I want. I want to keep that error smaller than 0 0.0001, uh, which is 1 over 10,000. All right, 0 0.1 is 1 tenth, 0 0.01 is 1 over 100, 0 0.001 is 1 over 1,000, 0 0.0001 is 1 over 10,000. So I want that error, this thing, to be smaller than 1 over 10,000. And what my theorem guarantees is that the error will be no greater than Bn plus one. So we need 
according to the theorem. Uh, so we need, or uh, we will be happy, or we will get this if B sub n plus one is less than one over 10,000, right? The error is no greater than Bn plus one. So if I want to make sure that this error is smaller than one over 10,000, it suffices to make Bn plus one smaller than one over 10,000 because the error is smaller than Bn plus one. And this is how these problems work in general. If I tell you approximate the value of some alternating series with some accuracy, some specified amount of error allowed, then you set Bn plus one less than that error amount. And this is an inequality which we will solve for n. Now, obviously, we cannot solve it in the state it's in now. I need to plug in for Bn plus one. Well, what is Bn here? This guy, it's the alternate, alternating harmonic series. We fucked with this one last time. We know it's a convergent alternating series. What are the BNs here? One over N. Thank you, thank you, Enrique. Yeah, BN is one over N. So what is B sub capital N plus one? If BN is one over N, what is this thing? Sorry, Kyle, I didn't see that. I was correct. Sorry. Yes. So if I'm going to plug in on the left hand side there, what is this piece? What goes here? Don't overthink this. Bn is one over n. B sub your mom is one over your mom. B sub hot dog is one over hot dog. B sub capital N plus one is. One over n plus one. Very good. One over capital N plus one. All right. Now I need to solve this inequality. Any ideas how we can solve an inequality like this? Multiply the denominator out. Yeah, we can like cross multiply, right? Think back to your good old days in algebra classes. If I cross multiply, I get 10,000 is less than capital N plus one, uh, which means capital N is greater than 9,999. So N equals 10,000 would work. Uh, it turns out the series we're working with here, this is also a neat way to measure how fast a series converges, right? How quickly the sequence of partial sums converges. What we found is that to get three decimal places of accuracy, I would need to use 10,000 terms in the series, which is a lot of terms. In other words, this series converges very slowly. So this is our answer. This is our answer. If I need to know how many terms that's the answer. I need 10,000 terms to get three decimal places of accuracy. Now let me play around a little bit with some shit. The first few terms of that series, uh, 
are this, right? That's the, the first eight terms of the series, the right? first seven terms of the series, sorry. Does anybody know, I, I think I mentioned the other day, does anybody know the full value of this series? I said it, not our last class, but like two or three classes before. Um, let me not spoil it then. Okay. Uh, computing the 10,000th partial sum for this series is not something I would expect you to do by hand. All right, it's, it's fucking adding up 10,000 fractions. Who's gonna do that by hand? Um, but Wolfram's good at it. I can ask this to sum negative one to the n plus one all divided by n from n equals, where we start, one to n equals 10,000. Make sure it's interpreting this correctly. Yes, it is. So this would be the 10,000th partial sum of this series. This is S sub 10,000. Let me just write this down. And then I will tell you what the exact value of this series is. And we will compare the two. So in other words, what we said here, i.e. S sub 10,000 should be accurate to at least three decimal places. Maybe we get lucky, we get more. But the theorem says should be accurate to at least three decimal places. The error should be less than this. Uh, S sub 10,000, we just calculated using Wolfram alpha. It is of course the sum from n equals one to 10,000 of negative one to the n plus one over n. And according to Wolfram alpha, that is 0 0.693097 and so on. I would not ask you to do a calculation like this on the test. Right. Of course, that would be unkind. I could ask you for this number. I could ask you for the value of capital N, but I could not ask you to could not ask you to calculate the ten thousandth partial sum of any series. Uh, Coburn's conjecture that this is pi squared over six is is not quite right. That's the one over n squared series. So here uh, we're looking at the alternating one over n series. Does anybody recognize this number? We made a joke about it. Nice. Natural log of two. Very good, I'm glad it stuck. So the true value of S is S equals the natural log of two. Now let's look at the first few decimals of LN2. Zero point six nine three one four seven one eight blah blah blah. So did we succeed? Zero point six nine three. Zero point six nine three. And what's more, how much am I off by in the fourth digit? Remember I said my error, I'm forcing my error to be less than 0 0.001. Well, look how much I'm off by here. If you subtract this from this, zero point six nine three one four seven one eight. 
minus 0 0.693097. I get 0 0.00005018. So here is my actual error. And is that smaller than 0 0.0001? Yes, it is. Very nice, right? Okay. Um, the work I would need to show you why this is the true value of s, I can't show you yet. We got to talk about power series first, and that's going to be after exam two. So do not worry about this. And do not worry about having to manually calculate the 10,000th partial sum of any series. I would never ask you to do that. But do worry about finding this value of n. And this was very simple, right? We're talking like three steps here. So if you want to approximate a convergent alternating series with some error, you just solve the inequality bn plus one is less than that error. And that will do the job. That will find for you the number of terms you need to use to get that desired approximation. Uh, the fact that we needed 10,000 terms here to get three decimals correct shows you just how slowly the alternating harmonic series converges. It's really trying to diverge, right? And remember, that without the negative one to the n plus one, without the alternating piece here, the series does diverge, right? The regular one over n series, the non-alternating one over n series does diverge. So one last little comment here, and then we're gonna move on to 11.6. The fact that we needed 10,000 terms to get three decimals of accuracy speaks to how slowly S equals sigma negative one to the n plus one over n converges. This series wants to diverge. And recall that without the negative one to the n plus one piece, without the alternating bit, this series would diverge. I can put the one in here. Right. So without the alternatingness, Right, without this piece blinking it back and forth from positive to negative every term, this series would be divergent. The series does converge, but it converges quite slowly. And if you took away the alternating nature of the series, it would no longer converge. Series like that are converging in a shitty way, right? This is, this is not a strong convergence. Now you need 10,000 terms to just get a little bit of accuracy. Compare that to a geometric series. All right, let me look at our favorite geometric series. Here is the first, what, five terms of the sigma one over two to the n series. And we know that this series adds up to two. Here with just five terms, we're almost accurate to two decimal places, right? Honestly, 1.9 is, is actually accurate to two decimal places because 1.9999999 is two. Um, so here with just, just five terms, we're getting very, very close. The error here is less than 0 0.1. If I add just a few more terms, now the error is less than 0 0.02. So fuck 10,000 terms, right? That's a slow, shitty convergence, 10,000 terms to get 
three decimals of accuracy. I don't know how far you need to go here to get three decimals of accuracy. It would be the natural log of, of 10,000, or it would be the base two log of 10,000. It's like 10, 15, maybe. Um, definitely not 10,000 terms. So what do I mean when I say that this series converges in a shitty way? Uh, well, specifically that it kind of wants to diverge and that when you take the alternating bit away, the series does diverge. That's actually the definition of the first term we need to discuss in 11.6. We're not going to use words like shitty in this definition because we're mathematicians. So this is now the beginning of section 11.6. Definition. If S equals sigma an, and I'm gonna uh, put some bounds on here, but remember it could be from wherever to infinity. If this converges, but the new series, um, call it S tilde, sigma n from one to infinity, absolute value of a n diverges, then we say that S converges conditionally And that's the word we use instead of shitty, conditionally, converges conditionally. Um, and I want to be clear that this is not the absolute value of S. Taking absolute values inside the series is very different than taking absolute values outside the series. So that's why I'm, you know, I needed some other notation for it. Okay, so the example we just saw. S equals sigma n from one to infinity, negative one to the n plus one over n, we know converges. By the alternating series test and the series I get by swapping uh, absolute values in there. This is equal to sigma n from one to infinity, one over n, right? Because the absolute value of negative one to any power is just one. Diverges. Therefore, for us, s converges conditionally. All right, if you take away the alternatingness, if you make all the terms positive, then this series goes from convergent to divergent. So we say that that convergence is shitty, weak. The word is conditional. The other side of this coin if S equals sigma n from one to infinity, absolute value of a n converges, then we say, I'm not going to invent more notation for this, sigma n from one to infinity a n converges absolutely. In fact, let me get rid of the s here. Don't want to make things confusing. 
Okay. So I want to take a second and chew on these uh, bits of language and make sure that you really understand them. If you have a convergent series, but when you take absolute values inside, that series becomes divergent, then the original series is said to converge conditionally. On the other hand, if you have a convergent series, down here, if you have a convergent series, and when you take absolute values inside, it stays convergent, then we call that absolutely convergent. And it is a fact, I'm not even going to call it a theorem, it's just kind of a dumb fact. If S converges absolutely, then S converges in the plain sense. All right. Uh, if I take absolute values inside your series and the series remains convergent, then the original series had to be convergent also. Don't get fucked up on this. It's not that it's not anything special. Really, what we're saying here is I can I can take the set of the, the class of all series and I can split them into two groups, convergent or divergent. Within that group of convergent series, I can split those up into absolutely convergent and conditionally convergent. Let me draw a diagram. So what we're saying is, we can categorize series as convergent or divergent and within convergent we can further categorize as absolutely convergent or conditionally convergent. So if you look at sort of all series, I can split them up as divergent and convergent. And then within my convergent series space here, I can split these up as absolutely convergent and conditionally convergent. So all series either converge or diverge. Among the convergent series, you can converge in this shitty weak way that we call conditionally convergent, or you can converge in this nice strong way that we call absolutely convergent. So the absolutely convergent series are a subset of the convergent series. In other words, if you converge absolutely, you must converge. The underlying analysis 
is called the triangle inequality. And if this were a serious analysis class, rather than Calc 2, if this was like real analysis one or complex analysis one, the very first thing I would do with you guys, day one, is prove the triangle inequality. It is the most important statement in all of calculus land, right? Analysis is just big boy calculus, calculus all with proofs. The triangle inequality is a defining property of metric spaces. So a metric space is a mathematical land where you can measure distance. There are mathematical lands where you cannot measure distance, for example, topological spaces or some other vector spaces. A metric space is just a, a space, usually numbers, right, um, where you can talk about a distance. And the most important fact about distances is, is that the shortest distance between two points is a straight line. If I'm trying to get from A to B, the fastest way to go there is go straight from A to B. Don't go over here to C and then to B. The triangle inequality says that the absolute value of A plus B is no greater than the absolute value of A plus the absolute value of B. And this is the version for real numbers. Also works for complex numbers also works for vectors under a certain concept of absolute value. This can be generalized to the statement, the absolute value of A1 plus A2 plus A3 plus all the way up to some A sub capital N and here's a statement for two things. Taking absolute value outside is less than taking the absolute value of each thing and adding them up. You generalize that to n things like this. And you might notice that these are the partial sums of some series. <clears throat> and further generalized to the following. The absolute value of a sum from one to infinity of a n is necessarily less than or equal to the sum from one to infinity of the absolute value of an. So in particular, if this thing is finite, then this thing is finite. And if this thing is finite, that means your series converges absolutely. If this thing is finite, that means your series converges in the traditional sense. Okay. Um, so I apologize for the detour on the triangle inequality. It's just something we have to say, because it is probably the most important fact in mathematics from the perspective of an analyst. All right. So what does it mean to say a series converges absolutely? It means when you make all the terms positive, the series still converges. What does it mean to say a series converges conditionally? It means that the series does converge, but when you make all the terms positive, that new series diverges. You need to know what absolutely convergent and conditionally convergent mean. And that rearrangement theorem I mentioned, where I can take certain series, change the order of the terms and go from convergent to divergent, or take a series that converges to say the natural log of two and reorder the terms to make it converge to one or pi or any real number, that can be done with conditionally convergent series only. So here's the neat fact. 
absolutely convergent series are nice. I'm not even going to put it in quotation marks. They are just point blank nicer than conditionally convergent series. And there are many interpretations of the word nice here. In the context of that rearrangement theorem, an absolutely convergent series could only have one possible value. No matter how you reorder the terms in an absolutely convergent series, it will still converge and still converge to that same number. Conditionally convergent series, you can reorder the terms and change the value of the series. You can even change it from convergent to divergent. Later, when we talk about power series, absolutely convergent series are the ones we can integrate and differentiate and will remain convergent. Conditionally convergent series, shaking it a little weird. So if I'm going to do some work with a series, I would really like to know that it converges absolutely rather than conditionally. And wouldn't you believe the tests we're about to introduce as their output have absolutely convergent rather than just convergent? Um, one more fact, and then I'll show you the test. A series of positive terms. If it converges, must converge absolutely. All right, a series of positive terms, when you take the absolute value inside, doesn't change. So all of the series we talked about in 11.3 and 11.4, if those were convergent, they were absolutely convergent because all of those series had positive terms only. But in 11.5, where you had a lot of alternating series, some of those were conditionally convergent. But a series of positive terms, if it converges, must converge absolutely. All right, that's enough of this bullshit. What do you want? You want the tool you're going to need to solve problems, right? Yeah. The root test. As promised, this is very mechanical. Given a series, S equals sigma n from one or wherever to infinity of a n. Compute the number L equals lim n to infinity nth root of the absolute value of a n. If L is strictly less than one, then S converges absolutely. You must remember this. If L is bigger than one, then S diverges. And the unfortunate case, if L is exactly equal to one, the test is inconclusive. This is the root test, sometimes called the nth root test, for the obvious reason. You take the nth root of the nth term. Uh, we make this absolute value and term because, you know, we're taking roots, we need them to be positive. Um, 
if that nth root of the absolute value of a n gets closer and closer and closer to some number which is itself smaller than one, then your series had to have converged absolutely. If the nth root of the nth term gets closer and closer and closer to some number L which is bigger than one, then your series had to have diverged. And if the nth root of a n approaches one itself, then we don't learn shit. And unfortunately, a lot of series fall into this category. So a quick note. P series and any series where a n is a rational function of n. come up inconclusive with the root test. <clears throat> so like one over n squared, <clears throat> this test won't work on it. One over n cubed, this test won't work on it. One over n to the one million, this test won't work on it. Even though all of those series are absolutely convergent, this test will not be able to detect that. Those series, although they are convergent, don't still don't even one over n squared, one over n cubed, which converge reasonably quickly, still don't converge fast enough to be detected by the root test. So the root test will only give us this absolute convergence res result if the series converges really fucking fast. In fact, kind of the speed at which a series must converge to be detectable by the root test has to converge at least as fast as a convergent geometric series. And I'm going to try to convince you of that with a little proof sketch. Suppose the series S equals sigma n from 1 to infinity a n has L equal to lim n to infinity nth root of absolute value a n, where L is strictly less than one. So I'm just going to prove the one case that if L is less than one, the series will converge. And I think you'll see that, um, that the comparison to geometric series is, is a valid one. Oh, uh, sorry, I missed something in chat. The end of that last fact was absolutely. So a series of positive terms, if it converges, must converge absolutely. Right? Because if you take the absolute value of some positive shit, it stays the same. So for a series of positive terms, the, the absolute value series is the same as the original series. <clears throat> So if you have a series of positive terms which converges in the old-fashioned sense, like all of the convergent series from sections 11.3 and 11.4, those were all absolutely convergent. Okay. So let's sketch a little proof. Let's see if we can understand what this theorem is saying. Why the fuck would this number be important? I'm assuming that my series has lim n to infinity n through absolute value of a n equal to L, where this number L is smaller than one. If lim n to infinity n through absolute value a n is equal to L, then for large values of n, what does it mean to say the limit of something is equal to some number? It means as n gets closer and closer to whatever this is, infinity, this thing gets closer and closer to that thing, right? That's the intuitive notion of a limit. <clears throat> then this means for large values of n, the nth root of the absolute value of a n is approximately equal to L.
All right, if I say the limit as x goes to infinity of f of x is 5, that means that for very, very big values of x, f of x is close to 5. So if the limit as n goes to infinity of this thing is L, that means that for very, very big values of n, this thing is close to L. Now raise both sides to the nth power. And then sum from one to infinity. Sum from wherever to infinity, just say sum. This will be approximately equal to the sum of L to the N. And the sum on the right <laughs> is a geometric series. Thus, L has to be positive, right? L can't, I mean, it could be zero, but it can't be negative. So since zero is less than or equal to L is less than one, we're assuming L is less than one. The series on the right, the geometric series on the right, must converge. Hence, sigma absolute value AM must converge. which means S, my original series, sigma n from one to infinity a n without absolute values, converges absolutely. That's it, that's the proof. So if your series passes the root test, meaning the limit from the root test comes out smaller than one, then your series is really, really close to some geometric series. What geometric series? The geometric series L to the N, where L is the number from the root test. So if that number L is smaller than one, then your series converges. And if that number L is larger than one, you could also take this same thing to say, if your number L is larger than one, then your series would diverge, or at least the absolute value series would diverge. Showing that the series diverges properly is a little more work, but that's it, <clears throat> right? So kind of this number L from the root test is the common ratio of the most similar geometric series. That's the intuition here, the number L from the root test is the common ratio of the geometric series that is most similar to your series, whether your series is geometric or not. It's kind of what this thing does is it, it looks to see if your series is similar in its behavior to some geometric series. And then L would be the common ratio of that geometric series that your series is most similar to. And it works for all sorts of stuff but it does not work for P series or for any series that is even remotely similar to a P series, any series where a n is a rational function of n, a ratio of two polynomials. All right, let me show you uh, a few applications. You remember the day we talked about the limit comparison test, I gave you two series to play with. One of which I said would become trivial once we had some more tests. The word investigate now has a new meaning for us, by the way. So this was the series, one of the two series I gave you that day. Um, when I say the word investigate now, what I mean is 
classify as divergent, conditionally convergent, or absolutely convergent. So if I ask you to investigate a series, I no longer just want you to tell me, does the series converge or diverge? I want you to tell me whether the series converges absolutely, converges conditionally, or diverges. I can run the root test on this series. <clears throat> And it's very mechanical. We just compute this number. If it comes out less than one, my series converges absolutely. If it comes out greater than one, my series diverges. If it comes out equal to one, then I'm fucked and I got to try some other test. Here, the limit as n goes to infinity of the nth root of the absolute value of a n is the nth root of the absolute value of the nth root of 2 minus 1 to the n. Now, an algebra fact you need to remember, we've discussed this in the past, is that powers and absolute values commute. So first I'm going to write that nth root on the outside as a 1 over nth power. On the inside, I'm going to say this is now the nth root of 2 minus 1 in absolute values to the n. And all of that is being raised to the power 1 over n. Of course, you're not going to plug n equals infinity into this thing. You're going to simplify it. If I have a bunch of shit all raised to the nth power, and then all of that shit is raised to the 1 over nth power, those powers cancel. And you get lim n to infinity, absolute value of the nth root of 2 minus 1. <clears throat> and since the nth root of 2 is always bigger than 1, this is always positive. So I can ditch the absolute values. And the nth root of 2 is 2 to the 1 over n. As n goes to infinity, 2 to the 1 over n goes to 2 to the 0, which is 1 minus 1, which is 0. So since L equals zero is less than one, the series S converges absolutely by the root test. And we did use some algebra uh, stuff in here, so let me be clear about what algebra rules we used. The nth root of something is the same as that thing raised to the 1 over nth power. You got to know this. The absolute value of some number raised to a power is the same as the absolute value of that number with the power outside. And then if you take a power like a to the b and you raise that all to some third quantity c, that's the same as a to the b times c. So these are the algebra facts that we used here. And hopefully you're familiar with all of these. If you don't like the dot notation there, I understand you can just put an a in here whatever, some number, some object.
Uh, the second one we're going to use a lot. We're going to use this all over the place. This third one we don't use super often, but definitely we do use it with the root test a lot. Uh, there was a question in the chat. How, so uh, what should we do? How do we know whether we're trying to say just diverge or converge versus diverge, converge conditionally or converge absolutely? Uh, certainly the homework problems will tell you classify as divergent, conditionally convergent, or absolutely convergent. And I'll, I'll probably specify that on the test also. Um, but here in class, when I say the word investigate, I always mean this. Right Now that we know what these terms mean, Every time I say investigate a series, I mean, I want to know exactly what does it do? Does it diverge, converge conditionally, or converge absolutely? All right, we'll look at more examples in a minute, but there is another test. The root test has a buddy called the ratio test. This is the final theorem from section 11.6. And the ratio test kind of does the same thing that the root test does. It's looking for a similar geometric series. So it says, given a series S equals sigma n from one to infinity or wherever to infinity of a n, compute L equals lim n to infinity absolute value of a n plus one over a n. If same output, if L is less than one, then S converges absolutely. If L is bigger than one, then S diverges. And if L is equal to one, the test is inconclusive. Uh, I could sketch a proof of this for you in the same way we sketch the proof of the ratio of the root test, um, but it, I don't think it's worth doing. I don't want to waste your time. Um, you should do it though, if you're curious about why this works, just apply the exact same logic we did before. Suppose this number is less than one and then take away the limit and say L is approximately this thing and try to deduce that your series must converge. L is again, sort of the common ratio of the most similar geometric series. Um, remember common ratios are what you get when you divide two consecutive terms of the series. So for a geometric series, whether you apply the ratio test or root test doesn't matter, you would always come out to the L being your common ratio. Of course you wouldn't do that, because we know exactly when geometric series converge and exactly when they diverge, um, but that's the intuition. Let me show you an example or two here. So I have here the series two to the n over n factorial, summed from zero to infinity. You know, based on our growth rates discussion, that this will get through the test for divergence, right? Both two to the n and n factorial go to infinity, but n factorial goes to infinity faster than two to the n. But just because these terms go to zero doesn't mean the series converges. The best test for this series and any series that involves factorials or factorial-like products is the ratio test. I'll say that again. The best test to use for any series that has factorials or factorial-like products is the ratio test. 
when you take your exam, which is next Wednesday, uh, if you see a factorial in a series, you should probably use the ratio test. And this is why we talked at length about canceling factorials back in the day. So even if we weren't talking about the ratio test right now, because this series has an n factorial in it, I would know to use the ratio test. And the ratio test says calculate L as the limit n goes to infinity, absolute value a n plus 1 over a n, and see if this number is bigger or smaller than 1. a n here is 2 to the n over n factorial. So what is a n plus 1? I'll put the bottom end. What goes upstairs? If this is a n, what is a n plus 1? Genuinely ask. <clears throat> Yeah, very good, Coburn. This is 2 raised to the n plus 1 divided by n plus 1 factorial. And notice where the parentheses are. This is not n factorial plus 1. And this is not 2 to the n with a plus 1 down here. It's like function notation. So the thing upstairs here should be 2 to the n plus 1 divided by n plus 1 factorial. The ratio test does require these absolute values. Please don't ignore them. The same is true of the root test. You can ditch the absolute values once you know everything is positive. Here, everything is positive. So we can ditch the absolute values. So I have lim n to infinity. You also got to know how to work with fractions. Can't get through this shit without that. This is 2 to the n plus 1 divided by n plus 1 factorial times n factorial over 2 to the n. And again, you're definitely not going to go plugging infinities into this thing. You need to clean it up first. Thankfully, the algebra here is not bad. And we do need to know how to work with fractions. What I'm going to do is take the 2 to the n plus 1 upstairs and the 2 to the n factor downstairs and kind of put them next to each other. And then upstairs, I'll take the n factorial and n plus 1 factorial and let them hang out with each other. All right, and everything here is being multiplied. What is 2 to the n plus 1 divided by 2 to the n? What is the, the kind of first part of this fraction here? Yeah, it's 2. So this is 2 times n factorial over n plus 1 factorial. And I did have a Calc 2 student not too, too long ago who wasn't familiar with this algebra rule, so I'll go ahead and say it. a to the m over a to the n is a to the m minus n. All right, when you divide like bases, you can subtract the powers. So 2 to the n plus 1 divided by 2 to the n is 2 to the 1. The challenge is dealing with this piece. 
And bad news, it's not n over n plus one all factorial. You can't like pop out the factorial. What can we do? Can anybody help me simplify this part? I'll bring the two outside the limit. And we'll be left with lim n to infinity n factorial over n plus one factorial. It is true that the top will cancel. The safe way to see this is to write it out. That's n factorial, remember? It's the product of all the positive integers less than or equal to n. And n plus one factorial is the product of all positive integers less than or equal to n plus one. So n plus one factorial is n plus one times n times n minus one times n minus two, all the way down to three times two times one. In other words, n plus one factorial is n plus one times n factorial. So the copy of n factorial upstairs cancels with the copy of n factorial downstairs. And the only thing that survives is one over n plus one. So I've got two times the limit as n goes to infinity of one over n plus one. And of course, as n goes to infinity, n plus one goes to infinity. So this is two times zero, which is zero. So then to finish things up, we would say, since L equals zero is less than one, the series S converges absolutely by the ratio test. All right. I know we are at time here, so I'm just going to say one more thing and then I'll let you go. There are a lot of factorial-like things out there which are not exactly factorials. And those are the places where people run into trouble on ratio test problems. I'd like to show you just one example in the book. I'm not going to do anything with it right now, but I want to show you what I'm talking about. These things might look like, where the fuck does this come from and why the fuck does anyone care? The answer to that question is because things like this show up in power series when you uh, take derivatives. Uh, if I take derivatives of like x to the 1 half, I end up with things like 1 times 3 times 5 times 7 downstairs. So the series that we're looking at, let's say in number 24 here, where they've actually written it out in sigma notation for you, the top is a straight up two to the n times n factorial. The bottom thing down here is five times eight times 11 and so on out to three n plus two. Products like these give people headaches. If you don't practice them, they will fuck you hard. So uh, you have some problems in the current homework and I've chosen relatively easy problems here. All right, there's nothing too wild. Uh, there's one thing kind of like this, right? This is the analogous problem, the number 24 in the book there. Um, I am going to give you more stuff like this to practice with down the road. But for now, I want you working on the homework problems. They're not too bad. And next time, I will give you some more practice with factorial-like products. Um, number 25 in your book or in your homework is an example. There are many more examples in the textbook. And if you feel you need more practice, which I promise most of you do, uh, you should look into the textbook. The section after this, 11.7, .7, is kind of like section 7.5. Remember section 7.5, where we just kind of put all of the integration techniques together? That's what 11.7 .7 is. Um, and there are some factorial-like products in series here. And they don't tell you what test to use. You got to figure it out. 
So I invite you guys to play around with the problems in 11.6 and 11.7. Once you finish the homework, you'll see at the end here the two series that I mentioned the other day. Uh, we will look at some of these together on Friday, and I will use section 11.7 primarily to build your study guide. Your study guide for exam two uh, will be published later today. Exam two is one week from today, and it will cover all of the stuff we've talked about since exam one which is section 7.8 on improper integrals and sections 11.1 .1 through 11.7. It's all of the basic convergence stuff. That test again is going to be next Wednesday. Um, that's it from me for today, guys. So I hope that you enjoy these new tests and these new notions of convergence. Uh, you now know as much as anybody should know about how to determine whether infinite series converge or diverge. Get ready for the test, all right? Prepare your butthole. Um, I don't want this to hurt you, but I know that test one did hurt a lot of us. And I'm still considering some sort of curve or grade correction on test one. I just haven't found something that I, I don't find abhorrent yet. Um, <clears throat> so please don't be terribly discouraged. I know that the exam one hurt a lot of you. I will not be applying any sort of curve or test corrections to anything later in the course, including exam two. Exam one's the only place where I'm going to like maybe do something there. And I still really haven't decided because I genuinely hate that stuff. So you need to work hard for exam two. You need to understand what improper integrals are, when they converge, and why. You need to understand what sequences are, when they converge, and why. And you need to understand what series are, when they converge, and why. You need to be well practiced with all of the theorems and all of the tests. That's it from me for today. Please work hard on the homework. I'll see you guys on Friday.